All right, our closing session today, I'd like to welcome George Noble, managing partner of Noble Capital Advisors, and John Roque, senior managing director, head of technical strategy, 22V Research out of New York. I think we need to buckle up for this one, right, George? A lot of excitement here. Uh, it's great to welcome George back. As, um, uh, as we spoke about earlier, this organization was really founded uh, upon the sell side of New York and the buy side of Boston. And today we're bringing together some of the best of, best of Boston and the best of New York uh, to share some of their experiences uh, over their multi uh, decades in the market. You know, John spent 20 years on the sell side, a little bit on the buy side as well. And many of you know uh, George Noble as well, uh, ran Fidelity's first uh, international fund. And he was also uh, mentored by Peter Lynch. So I don't want to stand in the way of this excitement here. I know we've all been waiting for this session. And uh, thank you today for, for finishing off. Uh, for okay. Thanks a lot, Bill. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I haven't seen this many people since my first communion, so um, um, it probably it, it's going to be a good presentation, I think, and I hope it's going to uh, generate some questions. I had to start it off with a little bit of my flair. Uh, if anybody's seen my reports over the years, I can't just send out a report that says technical review. Um, last week I sent out a note entitled Undefeated. The other night I sent one entitled uh, Mendoza Line, which if you're baseball fans from way back, you'll know that Mario Mendoza was a banjo hitting infielder who played mostly for the Pirates in the 70s. He spent nine years in the majors, five years he batted less than 200. And I thought getting below 4,200 uh, for the S&P was that uh, the equivalent of the Mendoza Line, irrespective of today's bounce. So hopefully, um, I promise I won't be as provocative as George. Um, but I think uh, you, you'll get a laugh or two. And I want to say straight out, I'm going to embarrass him here, but I'm going to embarrass him in a good way. Outside of the CMT, uh, there's nobody in existence who's doing more for technical guys, technical analysis, than George Noble via his spaces. Um, I've had the good fortune to be on there. Chris Verone was recently on there. Stan Weinstein, Michael Belkin, Walter Diemer, among others. So if you don't know George, uh, try to get to know him uh, today because he really is a champion for technical analysis. I first met George in 1994 uh, when I was at Lehman Brothers. And I traveled with a sales lady from New York up to Boston to meet him when he was running Teton. And I carried with me a candlestick chart book. It had a red cover and it would always come into my office in, at Lehman kind of a month late, but I brought it with me anyway. And when I went up with the uh, sales lady, her name was Claire Sutherland, we're waiting in George's reception area, and she said to me, he kills everybody. So if he kills you, don't be offended. Because the last time I was up here, the analyst was sliding under the table. So I said, whatever, I went to school in the Bronx, it's no big deal. <laughs> So uh, we go in, George meets us, invites us into his conference room, we sit down, and I plop down my Japanese candlestick charting book on the table. And George says, is that yours? And I said, yeah. He said, don't go anywhere. So he leaves the room. Claire Sutherland looks at me and just goes like this, you know, what did you do? George comes back in the meeting a minute later carrying his own Japanese candlestick charting book. And uh, we've been friends since, so thanks. Okay, here goes. <coughs> okay, so um, we think there's a regime change going on. I've come to it in my way, and George has come to it in his way. And we were going to start this, if the audiovisual was going to allow it, with Prince's song, When, D when Doves Cry. Because when you speak to institutional investors about a potential regime change, it kind of sounds like doves crying. They really don't want to embrace the idea. I thought it'd be a good idea to start this because the genesis or the gist of my presentation is trying to keep it as simple as possible. And if you grew up you know, in the era of the 80s, you'll understand all of my references. So Michael J. Fox starred in this movie called Doc Hollywood, and I'll just give you the synopsis. If this uh, link were working, we'd be watching it. So here goes. He's driving through South Carolina, crashes into a judge's yard. And instead of sent sentencing him to some time in prison, the judge sentences him to work in a local hospital. 
He works for an old guy named Doc Hogue. And you can see him right there. He looks like a Doc Hogue. And one night when Doc Hogue is fast asleep, a couple brings their young son into the, hospitals, uh, into the hospital and the boy can't breathe. He's really wheezing. And so the nurse on call, who's an experienced lady, says, we should call Doc Hogue. And the very hubristic Doc Stone says, I'm the doctor. I'm going to take care of this. And he makes this grand diagnosis such that he believes the boy's chest has to be cut open and they're going to have to conduct this major heart operation. And the nurse very wisely says, I think we should call Doc Hogue. And Michael J. Fox gives it to her. And then Doc Hogue gets on the phone and Michael J. Fox gives it to Doc Hogue. And you could just kind of have a sense how this is going to turn out. So they're wheeling the boy outside of the hospital on a gurney with an IV and oxygen, and Doc Hogue comes barreling down the street in his old Buick LeSabre. And you might remember the era of those cars. <clears throat> he gets out of the car, he's wearing his pajamas, and he comes over and he asks Doc Stone what the story is. And of course, Michael J. Fox's Doc Stone gives him this grand pronouncement, this grand diagnosis. He goes, the old doctor goes over to the boy, he looks at him and he says, You've been at your daddy's chaw again? And the boy says, uh-huh. Doc Hogue reaches into his pocket, pops open a can of Coke, hands it to the father and says, that'll be 65 cents. The point of the story here is that I think we, all of us in the business, tend to make things a little bit too complicated. I think sometimes the simple or simplest approach is the better approach. So in the honor of Doc Hogue, here goes. Okay, um, so uh, I, I had the very good fortune to spend four years at Soros Fund Management. I don't know Mr. Soros, so no questions later about what he's really like. Um, but of course, being there, you tend to pick up many stories about kind of his lessons to the people who did work for him. And this is reminiscent of one of those stories. So a guy named Paul Slovic did a horse handicapper study back in the 70s, and he wanted to see if more information led to better results from the horse handicappers. Now I'm going to turn around to read the numbers because I, I, I haven't memorized them or I've lost it over time. So with zero data points, the horse handicappers gave you a 10% accuracy rate with a 10% confidence rate. When you raise their data points to five, their accuracy went up to 17%, but their confidence level went much higher to 19%. Then when you overload them with data points, 40, their accuracy did not go up, but their confidence again soared. The point of the study was that you don't need all of the information that you might desire to make a decision. So George Soros had a famous line. He said, just give me enough information to make a decision. And I think sometimes we're overloaded, especially as technical people, with indicators. We end up checking a million indicators. Phil Roth, who was once president, or many times president of this organization, was known as the man of a thousand indicators. I kind of only think you need a few. And then when I was at Key Square Capital Management, which came out of Soros, uh, the former director of the CIA named George Tenet came to give a presentation at Key Square Capital Management. And all the questions from the people on the investment committee were really kind of pointed questions. Saudi Arabia, oil, North Korea, missiles. And the question came around to me, and I should have asked him, did you learn all you needed to know about running the CIA from your family's diner in Queens? But I choked. I didn't ask that question. I asked him the question about a study that's found on the CIA website, which was this kind of study. And I said to him, if you had to make a decision, but you didn't have all of the information at your, disposal, at your disposal, how long would you take to make that decision or would you make it at all? And he said, if it would have taken me five years to get 90% of the information or two years to get 70% of the information, I would make the decision based on that 70% of the information over two years. I thought that was an interesting way to analogize a lot of what we're trying to do. We can't have all the information, and certainly it can't be perfect information. Okay, please, uh, this is not about the election, so um, if you're going to melt, uh, you don't have to do it. <laughs> um, so, so, so this New York Post cover 
uh, was the cover the day after Trump won the election. I went around the corner on 59th off of Madison and I bought four newspapers. Uh, th you, you can't buy this anymore. I have one on my wall. Uh, a Stratega salesperson by the name of Pat Orwell has one on his wall. Uh, Scott Besson, who runs Key Square Capital Management, has one on his wall. And my childhood friend, Billy Brown, has one on his wall. That's it. There's no more. So I'm going to tell you the genesis of how this happened. In October of 2016, I was at a hedge fund dinner. And you know you're at a hedge fund dinner when the questions are 10 minutes long. Because everybody's asking a question has to prove to everybody else how smart they are. And the um, guest at the dinner was Philip Tetlock, who wrote a book entitled Super Forecasting. Has anybody read it? OK. So I was sitting here, Dr. Tetlock was sitting here, and the table went for like a quarter mile down that way. And the question started there, and they came all the way around to me. And I said, Dr. Tetlock, it's unlikely that anybody in this room will become a super forecaster. What's the lo what would you tell us is the most salient or important characteristic about becoming better forecasters? And he said, a lack of hubris. I thought that was a pretty good answer. And then he kind of screwed it up. He said, that reminds me. I just got a phone call when I was in the hotel before coming here from my best forecaster. And she raised the odds of Hillary Clinton winning the election to 99%. I said to myself, she can't win. There, he went against the exact, she went against the exact thing that he said was the most important thing about being a good forecaster. It was tremendous hubris to think that you could have a 99% confidence rate on something. And then I asked him a second question. I said, Dr. Tetlock, in your long career, have you ever decided to take consensus on a particular macro item, dollar, yen, oil, gold, S&P level, you, you got the drill. Find that consensus and do the exact opposite. He said, you mean in a contrary manner? I said, exactly. He said, I never thought about that before. The story means that we should always think in a contrary manner when the evidence is pointing in the other direction. However, it's sunny outside. If I said it's raining, that's not contrary. That's wrong. Right? The contrary opinion has to agree with what the charts are telling you. That's the key. And then, of course, I have some quotes here where I think you know they kind of lead into this story. My favorite quote comes from the bottom. It's from a book entitled Shut Up and Deal from the author by the name of Jesse May. Jesse May said, people think mastering the skill is the hard part. They're wrong. The trick to poker is mastering the luck. That's philosophy. Understanding luck is philosophy. I think that's really true for the market as well. OK, uh, here goes a perfect example of what I was talking about with Dr. Philip Tedlock. I'll read it to you. You could read it as well. Uh, there, is an increase, there is increasing chatter about the risk of recession in the US, with the recent yield curve inversion and commentary from prominent economists catching markets' attention. Using a comprehensive set of economic and financial market indicators, Bloomberg Economics has estimated a recession probability model. Here are our findings. Our model suggests the chance of recession within 12 months is close to zero. It sounds like Dr. Philip Tetlock's uh, forecast are all over again. Also, just to give you a, a history, um, if you go back over time and look at Brent on a year-over-year -year basis, not West Texas, because West Texas got to zero, or, or negative numbers, you remember that, of course. Uh, when Brent goes up at least 100% year-on-year, you always go into a recession thereafter. The PPI and CPI are more than 5% year on year. You go back 70 years, you nearly always go into a recession thereafter. And consumer confidence was really very low. Um, except for 2011, you'd normally have a recession thereafter. So the weight of the evidence, clearly those economists are not paying attention. Um, I, I like to look at magazine covers. Of course, everybody else likes to look at magazine covers. And Paul McRae Montgomery was the guy who put this study into action. I thought it was interesting um, that Jay Powell recently said, my goal is to get inflation down without a recession. John, John, George. John, is this the guy who, was, who coined the phrase transitory? Yeah, that's pr I'm going to get to that one, I promise. And I think Jim Bianco said something about yesterday or today was the one-year anniversary of that. So why would I listen to that guy? Well, maybe you're a fundamentalist. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. And then Lacey Hunt. Um, Lacey Hunt has had a laudable long-term record as a bond manager. 
He said monetary restraint has resulted in recession in all but 10% of the cases since the Fed's founding in 1913. Clearly, these people haven't done Lacey Hunt's work. Okay, so George said this. Uh, he, 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 um, he actually um, presaged this, and of course he used Jim Bianco's work as well to say this. So um, when, when the Fed first came up with this transitory baloney, I said to myself, I, I just don't believe it. I actually wrote in one of my notes, I had an open invitation to Jay Powell to join me on Webster Avenue in the Bronx so he could tell the good people there why paying higher prices was in their best interest. He's not yet RSVP'd. So I just went back 70 years, and all I did using that red line is determine how many months in a row the PPI printed 6% year on year. All I did was count. It was a pretty easy exercise. And I'm not surprised the 400 plus PhDs in the Fed didn't do it. So now we're up to 13 straight months in a row. The last PPI print was 15.2%. It's only been worse two other times over seven, 70 years. If you were around in the 70s, um, I was around in the 70s. My father was out of work a lot in the 70s. And I remember alternate days for gasoline with odd and even numbers on the back of your license plate. You had two periods, 34 months and 59 months, which were the only two periods over the last seven years where inflation was worse than what we're seeing now. Raise your hands. How many people have heard anyone on Wall Street say that inflation will be worse going forward? How many people have heard Wall Street people say we're peaking? It's true. Listen, uh, look at what... Um, uh, look at what this Danish politician said recently about prices. She said, if you want to stick it to Putin, take shorter showers. I mean, that's not a joke. She said that. It should be a joke that she's a member of the ECB, but that's not a joke. And what I did was I went back over time, and I just wanted to take a look at what the PPI did when it was high and what the S&P did when the PPI was also high. And except for the period in the early 50s, the, the S&P has had difficult times when you have an inflation rate this high. So it seems to me that we should expect some more difficult uh, market environment with inflation this high. And then finally, um, I just want to tell this little story because uh, it's remarkable how often we hear people in our business say the Fed thinks. Now, I would bet all the money in my pocket right now that not one person in this audience can tell me what the people in their family are thinking right now. So how is it likely that we can tell what the Fed is thinking right now? Impossible. Here's a little anecdote. This really happened. When I was at Key Square, uh, they employed, in a consultancy fashion, a former Fed governor. And he would come down to New York once a month and sit with everybody on the investment committee for an hour. Now, to be quite sure, I didn't sit with him for an hour because I didn't believe he could tell me what I wanted to know. I wanted to know about price. And he didn't know about price, as I mean with respect to the markets. So one day he came in and I said to him, you want to go for breakfast? He said, sure. So we went downstairs, 60th Street, Madison Avenue. We wanted to get a bacon, egg, and cheese. And I said to him, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said to him, how many civilians does the Fed, uh, pardon me, how many civilians does a four-star general speak to in a week? or in a year? And he said, I don't know. I said, the answer is zero. Every minute of his day is scheduled. He's not speaking to any civilians. I doubt he's speaking to any soldiers. Certainly, if it's, not a, uh, if it's not a photo op, he doesn't have any time. I said, you're from Jersey, aren't you? He said, I am. I said, maybe you'll get this one. How many civilians does a mafia capo speak to in a week <laughs> or in a year? And he said, how am I supposed to know that? I said, you're from Jersey. I thought you would know that. <laughs> Dog, careful. He said, uh, and then I said to him, they don't speak to any civilians. They speak to one guy on the street. No Instagram, no Pinterest, no texting, no, fo uh, no um, you know, Facebook, nothing. He puts the policy in that guy's ear. That guy puts out the policy. And if it's not followed, you've seen the movie. I said to him, now I'm quite certain you're going to be able to answer this question. How many civilians does the Fed chair speak to in a week or in a year? And he said to me, now I get your point. The point is that there is no way that anybody at the Fed understands what the guy on the street or the lady on the street is going through. They do not. They can't. 
And if you read the book, The Lords of Easy Money, you'll understand this a little bit more. The Lords of Easy Money is a recent edition. I really recommend it. Terrific read. It gives you kind of the inside workings of the Fed. Okay, um, w we all hear this. I'm certain some of us in here have said this. The market will be higher one year later. It's really not that helpful. <laughs> if you go back 28,000 trading days to 1910, the market is higher from any date in history one year later, 70% of the time. The market's higher one year later. I mean, okay. That's not, it. That's not analysis. We have to do a better job than that. If that's what you're listening, then that person's really not doing the work. Now, if your job is to just own them forever, well, then that's okay. But I'm sure that may have been the job for somebody who owns Zoom or NVIDIA or PayPal or Square or Teladoc. You get the point. You can't just depend on these trite market former truisms. Okay, I'll tell you, this is my chart. I know Jim used it. He's used it a few times, but it's my chart. Okay, it's okay. I thought it was the Chicago way, but I understand. <laughs> um, so um, you might not, but maybe you, you kind of would be surprised as to how many people believe the bond market is not the capo di tutti capi of all market indicators. So I said that I had uh, spent some time at uh, Soros Fund Management, and I do know Robert Soros, who's Mr. Soros' son, and Robert is an excellent guy. And one day he said to me the following, we were talking about the bond market, and he looked at me very seriously and he says, John, the bond market never lies. And he's right. The bond market's undefeated. It's 14 and 0, using all of those red uh, markings there. When there's a rise of tremendous magnitude, something breaks. Now, we've had a big rise so far. Something has not yet broken. But are you going to fight the bond market as the capo di tutti capi? John, I have to interrupt. If I look at the trend, you, you've taught me this. I see a series over many years of lower highs and lower lows. But if I look carefully, and I need new glasses, it looks to me like this one. We've broken. If I drew the trend line, I got my crayons and ruler out and the Fibonacci and all that kind of stuff. It looks like 15 is already a, is broken the downtrend. So what does that mean? How would you respond to that observation? I'd say that you got pretty darn close, if not just above. Let's say the jury is still a little out on uh, that. So I do need new glasses. No, so that's okay. Uh, Maybe I didn't draw it properly. But right. you know, it's still a little bit out. I will tell you that that is a big concern amongst institutional investors who pay attention to the bond market. Did we break the trend line? Did we break the trend line? Well, we didn't really break the trend line the other times, and you still had things break. So maybe you don't need it to have it break, but um, we we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, I, I, I recreated uh, the S&P's uh, technology group to really give it what I think is the proper weighting. So if you use the S&P numbers, they will tell you quite recently that tech weighs about 26.5% of the S&P. That can't be right. There's no way that tech is weighs, weighs less now than it did in March of 2000. It can't be. So all I did was just add back the stuff they took out, and I got to the number we have now, which is 40% of the S&P. And it was 45% in December. It was 44% in September of 2021. And during that time, I said, I, I don't think this can go higher. If you're betting it to go higher, then you're betting it's going to continue at the rate that it went up, which would have meant that at the end of 2022, it would have been 20% higher than it was at the end of 2021, because that's really what tech grows, right? Tech goes up about 20% a year. And I thought that that could not happen. And so Steve Chauvin, uh, who is my mentor, and I worked with him for four years at Lehman Brothers, always told me that you always get hurt by the biggest thing in the market. You never get hurt by the smallest thing in the market. And of course, that would have been basics, energy, and utilities. So I thought it was right to con underweight tech at the very least. And tech has come in 45% to 40%, but these are my numbers. And this is one of George's favorite charts. I'm going to you know, kind of preempt you a little bit. But this is tech relative, tech's market cap relative to energy's market cap. And you could see where the peak was in September of 2020. Certainly, it's in a ton as tech's market cap has gone up a lot. And tech, uh, pardon me, energy's market cap has gone up a lot. And tech has come in from 45 to 40%. 
Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite charts because I think it is perhaps the, mo the simplest chart in the whole packet. It is merely the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index divided by the S&P 500. Now, we all sit really close to our screens every single day. And how many of you out there have to answer the question internally or externally, is that the turn? Is that the low? And I know the S&P was up big today. Is that it? Is that the low? Is the low in? And people want to believe that intraday move more than they want to believe this. This is fairly unbelievable to most people in this business, that commodities could be in a position to do relatively better than equities. In fact, I would tell you, since I've been showing this chart over a year and a half, I would say 95% of the people believe it cannot happen. Some people believe that it's, you know, it could happen. I think this is perhaps the most important and simplest chart in the whole regime change thesis, especially since commodity bull markets tend to last about 15 years. Um, before I go on, I don't think I have it in here, but I just wanted to also say that if you take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average relative to NASDAQ, that is also making a relative turn higher where the Dow looks like it will outperform. I've referred to it as the fourth turning. Perhaps some of you out there have read the book, The Fourth Turning. Uh, the Fourth Turning, uh, I won't go into that, it's uh, uh, Howe and Strauss, please read it. But I think that this is the fourth turning for the Dow to outperform NASDAQ, and it goes along with the uh, Bloomberg commodities to outperform the S&P. This is another simple chart which shows the S&P relative to gold. I started to show it late last year because I thought the only way you were buying tech over gold, pardon me, the S&P over gold was because you thought that 1999 and 2000 was going to repeat itself. Otherwise, you should not have been buying more S&P relative to gold. You should have been selling S&P relative to gold. Again, another simple look. I, I, I'm sorry to say this here. I may be uh, uh, committing blasphemy, but I'm going to say it. Tyler, Bill, sorry. I, I'm, I'm not big on a ton of indicators. I'm really big on trend. I tell people I'm not a trader, I'm a trender. But one of the indicators that I think is perhaps at least the best for me is the number of new highs and new lows on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. And I think it's true because while we all believe we have special powers as stock pickers, we're really terrific stock pickers when new highs are running like Earl Campbell over defenders with respect to new lows. When that dynamic changes, we're kind of average at best. And when new lows outnumber new highs, I mean, you're really trying to do the best job you can because it's really a hard job. So I accumulate or accumulate the number of uh, net new highs, and you could see what it is uh, to the left with respect to the NYSE and NASDAQ, and you could see NASDAQs on the right with the uh, NASDAQ itself. Um, this is from a few days ago. From its peak, the NASDAQ cumulative uh, net new highs are down 33% from their peak. They're below, you could see it more on the left-hand chart, the pre-COVID peak. And I have a thesis in this environment that most items will get back to their post-COVID breakout. That's my thesis. We've seen a lot of it occur already. And most famously, at least in my book, is that it's occurred for J.P. Morgan, which should be an amber flashing light to all of us. I, I, I like to create a lot of my own indexes, um, and I call it non-growth, mostly because I didn't want to have to uh, define value. I leave that to fundamental guys. I'll tell you what's in this. It's easy. It's XLK and XLY in the numerator, and then in the denominator, it's XLB, XLE, XLF, and XLI. That's it. So, of course, it's growth value, but I call it growth to non-growth because, again, I didn't want to define value. And it's been pretty helpful. Momentum peaked in the spring of 2020. Price peaked later in 2020, came down into 2021, rallied back, made a lower high. Momentum, of course, tremendously oversold and had kind of an echo rally into the uh, second high. But you could see what it looks like on a monthly basis to the left. Weekly, we're tremendously oversold, and we should get a rally. George is going to show you a, a table that I put together later, which should probably help me explain this a little bit better. But and I know this is only one example, so it's not great for, uh, for stats class, but it's great for portfolio management class. 
Sometimes you could stay oversold for a long time, right? So there's really two definitions of oversold. The first one is prepare for change, and the second one is weak. So I think we're in the second definition. So John, Frank Teixeira, who I think is here, he had the best definition of oversold a few years ago, and Frank, I don't know if you're out there somewhere, but I recall Frank said, the definition of oversold is the stock went down, I forgot to sell it. That's right? a good Just definition. Like definition of overbought is, oh, it went up and I forgot to buy it. So Frank, I, I, listen, to ev I, I, I listen to everything you say and I don't forget it. So kudos to you, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, John. Um, here's another look. This is NASDAQ on a weekly basis. So I've used the line that when NASDAQ peaked on a momentum basis, which was in February of 2021, the index didn't peak until about nine months later. I thought NASDAQ had a negative momentum divergent debt to be paid, right? Revenge is a dish best served cold. It was served cold here because nobody was really paying attention because prices kept going up and the market was really insulated by seven stocks because um, the percentage of stocks above their 200 day moving average for the NYSE peaked in December of 2020. It peaked for NASDAQ in February of 2021. I mean, those are amber flashing lights. And I know people were using breath as a reason to stay in there, but it was kind of like you were deteriorating on the inside, but you looked good on the outside. I have a 62 Impala in my garage. Everybody loves it from the outside, but son of a gun, it's an old guy. You need to take care of it, right? That's kind of what the market was telling me is that the internals were deteriorating. New highs were deteriorating. The percentage of stocks above their 200 day were deteriorating but seven stocks kept insulating you. And so I think there are messages here. We just have to learn to listen to them, right? And they change your aggressiveness with respect to buying stocks. As momentum is deteriorating, you can't be as aggressive as you were as when momentum is pushing aggressively higher. It's kind of like winning, your best team winning without its best players on the field. You know that doesn't last very long. So, um, Sorry for these little memes, but um, George is a big meme guy, so um, this is one uh, that's really too woke for me, so I'm going to pass this. <laughs> you want to take a picture? All right. <laughs> Not of the charts, but of this guy? Okay, fine. I'll, 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 I'll tweet it out. Uh, you should follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'll tweet this out. Don't worry. I'm old enough now, I don't care. I just put it out there. So my Aunt Carmela used to say in Italian, God rest her soul, when you get old, your, your, your tongue gets long. You don't care. You know, um, George is not as old as my Aunt Carmela was, but seriously, he, uh, he could probably uh, uh, agree with that. I thought the easiest call this year was that the German two-year Bund yield uh, would move sharply higher, as would their 10-year Bund yield. And I thought it was a fairly easy call, not to be a wise guy, that 3% for the twos through 30s for our yield, cu yield curve should work two or near 3%. That's where they were in 2018. I didn't think it was a heroic call. It was just getting back to the top of the range. But it was really difficult to make that message get across to people on the other side of the phone or the other side of the emails. I think that's also a good sentiment tell. A good sentiment tell is when you have an idea working for you and even your colleagues don't want to buy it. That's a really good sentiment tell. So you know, you've heard this, of course. You, people will say, everybody owns that. And I'll say, do you own it? They'll say, <laughs> no. I'll say, then not, everybody doesn't own it. <laughs> right? you, ha you can't contrary <laughs> yourself. Right? I, I've been asked the following question recently. What would get you more positive on the market? And I don't really like answering that question. I want to ask the following question. What would get you less positive on the market? Can you tell me what would make you less positive on the market? Nobody wants to answer that question. Make you more positive because things would have had to break. Yeah. Below 4,200? Anybody else? Russia throws a nuke. Okay. I hope not. We got a slide for I that one. I hope he's got a bad arm. <laughs> We got a slide for that. You just stepped on it. You, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that um, I, I would rather be long commodities relative to the S&P. I think we're in a commodity bull market. Um, in December of 2020, when I was at my former shop, I hosted a panel uh, within a macro conference where concentrated almost exclusively on commodities. 
because that's really when they broke out uh, above their prior range. Not to new highs, but you could see that uh, horizontal line there uh, where it broke out to a six year, um, broke out of a six year base in November 2020. Nobody was on board. I'm not telling you that because I was, was on top of it. What I'm just trying to give you is the sentiment. Nobody was really prepared. And I think part of the reason they were not prepared is because this is the unintended consequences of an ESG mandate. The ESG mandate unintentionally pushed more people into greater weightings on the technology side, much greater weightings than they might have already had because the consultants want them to be kind of ESG focused. I thought it was a tremendous opportunity with respect to commodities. Freeport McMoran quintupled off of its low. And of course you could see that this is a, a giant base and of course I've carried around the phrase Brob Dignagian base for a long time. I trademarked it. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I trademarked it. The dollar index seems very strong, breaking out. This is another uh, thing that I think offered tremendous sentiment insight. Strong index, strong dollar performance, yet hedge funds we're believing that there was going to be a de-dollarization. It, it might happen, but certainly the dollar wasn't buying it. John, can I interrupt for one second? Yep. Talk about sentiment. I think it was at a, uh, a round table that you did, your, a macro conference, maybe at your former shop. And I remember it was uh, beginning of 2021, so it was about 15 months ago. And remember one of the consensus call was everybody knew the dollar was going to zero. No disrespect intended to some of the brightest minds on the planet. It happens. When you People make mistakes. But you listen to these guys. I was hanging on to every word and consensus to a man. You got to short the dollar. Yeah. Nobody knows nothing. And it's the same case. Yeah, that's true. And when the chart didn't agree, you knew you had something. This is the S&P relative to NASDAQ. It looks like the turn is in its infancy. So I expect the S&P to outperform NASDAQ. And I think bl commodities will outperform stocks. That's kind of the regime change here. And commodity bull markets go for about 15 years. Hi, Helene. It looks a little bit different. It looks uh, uh, of late in that latest turn up, that's, that's similar. So th th there is great similarity here. And when the Dow outperforms NASDAQ, there's really a tremendous plurality of outperformance. Okay, um, so uh, if you're not a Yankee fan, those are the breaks, right? Um, but Yogi famously said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, George Noble. Thank you very much for your time. Carla, do you want to come on up? No, but before I get started, so um, I'm the most unlikely social media personality, but uh, starting in December, I discovered Twitter Spaces, and I'm not here to promote my YouTube channel, but here to try, try to raise money for charity. Um, I've been having a lot of the best minds in the business come on um, at, at no expense to speak to um, the Twitter the Twitter sphere, and folks like John, Dan Weinstein, Tony Greer, Tom Thornton. The list goes on. We've probably done a couple dozen of these things, and it's been delivering the highest quality research to the public at large, something they've never had access to. You know, on what planet does the average individual investor get to talk to John Ray? doesn't happen. And so the, the quality of these spaces is really unsurpassed. And I don't say this immodestly. It's not because I'm smart. It's because I've been in the business for decades and I have a pretty big Rolodex. I don't know, maybe the younger crowd doesn't know what a Rolodex is, but uh, Microsoft contacts are Outlook list. At any rate, um, so people like John have graciously come into the room and it's enjoyable. They give questions and they're teaching. And so the pitch we've been making to people is that if they find the spaces of value to please give back and pay forward. We started this uh, charity effort about a month ago. We've raised $63,000 so far, um, and we're just getting started. And so um, I spoke to Tyler about this effort, and um, the CMT has 
graciously um, been willing to back us or make contributions. So, Tyler. So, in discussions with our board of directors, obviously the CMT Association uh, supports a lot of different causes. JC Pretz and the, the Chart Summit raised a ton of money last year. Uh, Traders for a Cause, these are all organizations that not only deliver great education from experts uh, in the business and help uh, steer them away from get rich quick schemes, but also raising money for a good cause. So, uh, our board of directors is pledging $1,618 uh, to the fund. For those of you who follow your Fibonacci's, we'll, we'll see how that uh, extension <laughs> plays out uh, for you, George. Thank but you. Thank you very much for thank being here. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, yeah. for, thanks for having us. The charity in question, by the way, um, we picked World Central Kitchens. World Central Kitchen, if those of you aren't familiar, they're uh, producing hot meals for people uh, who really need them. In particular, they've been very uh, active in the Ukraine of late. There are three and a half million refugees in the Ukraine and they're, produce, they're uh, preparing 300,000 uh, meals a day. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, a direct link in, our twi in my Twitter feed um, where you can find this and it makes it really easy to uh, just put your credit card in. And as I said, we started this about three or four weeks ago. We've raised $63,000 as a special inducement here today for limited time offer only. I feel like I'm Jerry Lewis doing one of those uh, telethon squeeze jobs. So I collect a lot of things. So souvenirs from the bear market. Um, we have here a World Calm racing hat, <laughs> and here's a baseball cap from Enron Field. <laughs> so anyone who gets it, it, so the highest bidder, the, the two highest bidder, the two highest contributors will get a hat, and there are, there are, I have more hats if people want them. So anyone, I guess what I'll say is, if you give $1,618, you'll get an appropriate hat or similar, something of similar uh, worth. But, you know, worth is in the, in the eyes and beauty of the beholder. All right, so let's, let's move on. So how do I work this thing here? Point to that one. Point to that one. Right arrow. Oh, there we go. There you go. Okay, so as John was saying, I grew up at Fidelity, and I was very fortunate to have been in the right place at the right time. Yeah, you know, I work hard and I'm reasonably intelligent, I think, but I stand on the shoulders of greats, and Peter Lynch was my first boss. And we, unfortunately, I was going to play a video clip. We're not able to do that here today. So I'll just paraphrase what he says in this clip. You can find it on my, uh, on my, on my, on my Twitter feed. But basically, it's a signature line about know what you own, do the work. Um, you know, the stock market's not a game. It's become a game because of the easy monetary policies that we've seen, the reckless behavior of central bankers. But know what you own. And for years, that didn't seem to really matter very much because the Fed was your, the, 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 because of FOMO and the, and, and the Fed was your friend. But now, knowing what you own starts to matter a little bit. And, you know, do the work. So here's a guy who's, you know, he, he's the GOAT, greatest of all time, in my opinion, an unparalleled record. And John talked about keeping it simple. Peter, aside from being a fine human being, he would keep it simple. If you met him, you would never know that this was the greatest mutual fund manager of all time. But he was a great analyst, and he broke it down into its constituent parts. He's not a chartist. I've been asked the question, I was asked a question at the CMT three years ago, somebody to the effect, you know, if you only could do fundamentals or charts, what would you do? And that's a really hard question to answer. I don't really quite remember what the answer was. I didn't like the, que I didn't like the question. Um, I instead try to pursue both, use both the left side and right side of my brain. And I think ignoring one, the, you know, expense of the other, it just doesn't work. So I, I like to do both. So here's a guy who, maybe he was a closet technician, I, don't really, I really don't think so, um, but the greatest fundamental investor. Now I wanna, I wanna compare and contrast that with this fellow. So Mark Minervini, one of the greatest technicians out there, um, he doesn't really pay attention to fundamentals. Uh, most notably last fall, there was that clip on CNBC, I'm sure a lot of you saw him, where he was asked, he was pitching and rattling off some names to Tyler Matheson, and I think they came up on Upstart was one of them. And Tyler Matheson said, and he was, was happy at the fact the stock had gone up 25% in a week. And Tyler Matheson interrupted, he goes, well, what do they do? And Mark's like, huh? And he said, what do they do? What does the company do? And all of a sudden he's like, well, I think we have technical difficulty. I can't, I can't hear you, <laughs> all right? But this guy, my God, he won the national trading championship last year 
I think up 334 percent. I believe he's the only guy who's ever won it twice. He won it in 1997 as well. He wouldn't know if fundamentals have bit him in the backside. So he's all charts, he's all technical analysis. I don't know what his secret sauce is. He's a disciple of our mutual friend Stan Weinstein. But so there are horses for courses. There's no one right way to do it. I think the most important thing is what John said: keep it simple. Then there are these guys, all right, where. <laughs> They don't, they don't do the fundamentals. They don't even have a rigorous uh, technical system. It's all number go up, bro, right? Or it's stock to flow model or whatever, okay? They're just winging it, all right? This, by the way, and there's a really, I know this is funny, but there really is a serious message in this, okay? And I don't want to get into a big debate about a food fight about crypto because people have very hard feelings about it and you're not gonna convince anybody. The bears hate it. The bulls love it, and never the two shall meet. But thought experiment. Do you think this would have been possible if we were in more normal times when interest rates were, say, 3 4 5%? Think about it. OK, so regime change. This is, comes from our friends at GavCal. And here what they've done is they take the, uh, the top 15 stocks, you know the names, you can throw the Chinese ones in, whatever, get up to the top 15. And they represent 20% of the global mar market cap. More than Japan, more than emerging markets. Like, really? There's nothing new under the sun. We go through regime change all the time. Again, from GavCal. Depending on your age, some of you will, may not be that familiar with some of these, but I'm, I'm old enough to remember when. John was talking about the gas lines before, okay? I was a summer intern in 1980 at Fidelity. They gave the junior energy, energy stocks to Paul Stuka, who was a summer intern the same year I was there. I was kind of miffed because I got stuck with non-ferrous metals. <laughs> um, actually, I, I did, I did, I did win the, in the end, I, I won the, got the better of that trade. I happened to be the auto analyst as my first, uh, when I was a permanent hire in 1981. I was fortunate enough to have been the auto analyst for Peter Lynch when he went to Detroit and visited Chrysler and Ford and General Motors and I carried his bags and I knew enough to shut up and just listen. <laughs> it served me very well. At any rate, 1980 was energy. 1990, Japan. Um, I rode the Japanese bull market pretty extensively in the 80s and quit Fidelity actually to start a hedge fund to short Japan in 1991. That was when, you know, the Emperor's Palace is worth more than the entire state of California. They were buying Pebble Beach, Rockefeller Center, et cetera, et cetera. 2000, we all, I think, know in this room, requires no comment. 2010, it's going to be China, and look where we are now. As uh, you, our, uh, our favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra, would say, you can observe a lot by watching. You can. I'm just going to go quickly on this, but this kind of, I mean, look at this. The market, I mean, Peter always used to say, maybe the old cyclograph chart books, I don't know if they still make them or not, but you look at a long-term chart of a stock, and it'd be the earnings line and the, and, the, and, the, and the price line. And on average, not every week, not every quarter, but on average, the earnings line, the stock price line would follow the earnings line. Company made more money, stock price went up. Well, because of the largesse of the world's central banks, in the era post-great financial crisis, it wasn't just earnings that drove stocks. You can see, this comes, by the way, from my, my, my good friends at Kalish Concepts, I have to put a plug in for them. They were very helpful in providing this information. Uh, so Matt, if you're out there watching, thank you. Um, S&P earnings up 200%, the market's up 950%. Something's gotta give. And I suspect, as John was saying before, given what's happening to interest rates, and that's not good for price earnings ratios. It's not gonna be, it, it be the E may go down because we're gonna have a recession, but the valuation's certainly gonna go down, in my opinion. This is just the, uh, I deliberately picked this um, just to show you can lose a lot of money in bonds. I mean, the Austria 100 year bond in the last year and a half, you know, has more than fallen in half. And think about it, especially when you're buying a growth stock, embedded in that is, is a, I mean, it's a super long duration asset. Think of it as a 30 year zero coupon. And I don't think certain investors fully appreciate that. They just bought the narrative. And number go up, so why not? 
from our friends at Gap. This is from Jeff Gong. Uh, sorry, um, I don't want to make it too much macro, but just throw this one in for fun. Like, is uh, the famous line from um, Margin Call to Mr. Powell. I understand inflation's at eight and a half percent. This is out of date. I think wage growth is even higher. Inflation's at eight and a half percent. Oil's breaking out. Inflation is eight and a half percent. Yet we have amongst the lowest Fed funds rate in recorded history. Pretend I'm a small child or a golden retriever. Explain that to me. <laughs> Interest rates. It's as if you have a beach ball. You hold it underwater. You suppress it, and then you let go. It comes up to the surface, and that's what's happening now. And Jim Bianco, I thought, really spelled out quite well how challenged fixed income markets are, and the regime change John and I are focusing on largely incorporates that view. All right, this is a very busy chart, so I'm going to just quickly pass on it. And I, I will make all these slides available later if anybody wants them. Again, it comes from our friends at Kalish Concepts. Um, the upper left, which is probably the one you can read, shows what happens if you paid 33 times revenues for Cisco at the top of the CMP bubble in 2000. It took 20 years to get back to break even. So everyone says, oh, stocks for the long term, you're going to make 9%, blah, 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 blah. Your entry, entry point matters. Conversely, if you just bought anything, threw a dart at the wall in 2009, I didn't do that, but if you had, you would have made a killing. So entry point matters. And just so you, so you say, that's a nice chart, George, but what does it mean for now? On the lower left, I know it's busy, but these, I'll make these slides available. Here's just a list of stocks in the market now that are over, over 33 times sales. I didn't say earnings, I said sales. They're losing money and they're issuing equity. And you go over on the right, what uh, Kalish did, the light blue line is just the S&P, and the darker blue line show is, is the index of those stocks. Um, and then beneath that is a bunch, bunch of stocks that are actually more expensive than Cisco was in 2000. This is mind boggling. The upper left, Again, Kalish con Concepts, thank you, Matt. You, you see, say, George, what are you talking about? 10, I mean, 10 times sales, 20 times sales, 30 times sales. You might remember uh, Scott McNeely famously said back in the dot-com bubble how crazy it is or what you're expecting to earn, what, you, what, the, what you're expecting the company to do if you, if you pay 10 times revenues for a company. It's just insanity. Here we have companies on 20, 30, 40. I don't even know what Snowflake does. I couldn't tell you, I just know it's on 50 times sales. And as Joel Tillingham, and it's got like a you know, multi tens of billions of dollar market cap. And as Joel Tillingham, a former colleague of mine at Fidelity would say, the story is right, but the price is wrong. <laughs> and the problem in this, in this market we've been in, things have become completely untethered from fundamental value. It's been all about liquidity. Which, by the way, has interesting implications for charts, and we should talk about, and so I'm done with my rant, why technical analysis is particularly important um, in, in, the, in this market environment. A fundamentalist like myself would not have had you stay in on the way up. If you're just following a narrative, you would have bought, you would have drank the Kool-Aid, you would have stayed in, and you'd be getting destroyed right now. Valuation didn't, wasn't an indicator on the way up. It's not going to be an indicator on the way down, in my opinion. But George, it, 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 you know, when we went over the chart on the left, what, can, can you explain it? In, sure. Uh, what, what, what so this just shows you, if you pay 20 times revenues, again, not earnings, revenues, it shows you on a 10-year view, not only did you have a chance of losing money, you had a 55% chance of the company being delisted. Delisted! Oh, but it's a good story, bro. <laughs> All right? <laughs> um, and then, if you look at the bottom here, this one you can understand, the three-year excess return of stocks if you buy them over 20 times sales. So whenever you hear someone 10 times sales, 20 times sales, run, do not walk as fast as possible away from that. Do not listen to the story. Um, and then the upper right, it just shows you if you're paying over 20 times sales, what are the odds that you're gonna beat the market? Again, I think it was Warren Buffett who famously once said, you know, in the short run, the stock market's a popularity contest, in the long run, it's a weighing machine. Same thing pulled up again. I mean, you want to know where are we? I mean, well, <laughs> we know what happened to all the, all, the, all the obscenely valued stocks coming out of 2000 when the liquidity got taken away. $50 in double jeopardy, you can 
use your crayons and fill in the rest of the upper chart. Um, thought experiment, something, John, you said made me really think. You were talking about the commodity stocks and how they really, um, I want to ask you a question, John. So you were talking about how the commodity stocks would not have done as well, Freeport McMoran, for instance, because um, the ESG and the pandemic. Thought experiment. Where do you think, what do you think the market would have done if we had not had the pandemic? We'll, we'll put it this way. Would the S&P be at 4,300 if there wasn't a pandemic, if had we not had a pandemic? Would interest rates have gone to 50 basis points had we not had a pandemic? And the reason I asked the question is, if, if, if that's not normal, if that was just an experiment and not normalizing, and, and don't get anchored with recency bias, but just you know, think about like, if you were a Martian coming, you know, came down from planet Mars, and someone said to you, inflation is this, they might say, well, why are bond yields at 2.8%? And, oh, but you don't understand, it's transitory. And, you know, why are they keeping the, the Fed funds rate at whatever it is, 1.5%, whatever the number is, I lose track of it. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But, John, where would the market be had we not had a pandemic? Do you have any thoughts about that? I think going into the pandemic, you were starting to get the breakouts in what would have been considered at that time late cycle stocks. You know, basics, industrials, and then, of course, it hit, and that came in sharply. So I think that we're getting here kind of what would have been, you know, the excess of what you would have gotten normally because of all the Fed uh, induced liquidity. But I think you would have gotten some breakout, but it would have been late cycle stocks that would have been leading then. What about, though, the, um, the more, how shall we say, formerly richly valued parts of the market? Would they ever have ascended to the heights that they went to? Well, I don't think so, but the Fed was not allowing there to be price discovery in the bond market. I mean, just consider now, uh, the CPI is at 8%, right? The Fed funds is at 50 basis points. If the Fed really wanted to do something, you have to get Fed funds above CPI. I mean, that's never going to happen. They're never getting the Fed funds above the CPI here, right? They're kind of secretly hoping that the market yeah, kind of so does so it to them. So, John, they're, 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 they're talking the talk, but do you think they actually want to walk the walk? No, so I, I've said that the CPI is Usain Bolt, and the... Fed funds rate is a bunch of Birkenstock wearing, you know, Beaujolais <laughs> sipping, <laughs> cornhole playing Fed fund people, Fed guys. So, I mean, they're never going to get it there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, 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 John, I mean, I know there are concerns right now about China. Um, and, and, and I think, again, Frank Jeff Sarah, please call your office. Commodities got overbought, so maybe get a little bit of a correction or something yeah, like that. I, I, I actually think that this could be the opportunity to buy commodities, right? They're in a bull trend. So, you know, um, you know, this will be the correction for them, I think, and then in a correction consolidation, this is where you want to be, because it would seem to me, and I don't know anything about China, but once they come out the other side, they would seem to have to stimulate, right? Right? They would seem to have to stimulate. I think that would be commodity positive again. And, and, and again, one of Jim Bianco's uh, charts from this morning showing the, uh, the uh, very bullish commitment with traders reports, all the hot money was in commodities, it would be, I mean, again, Walter Deemer, please call your office. You know, the market will do what it can to confound the most number of people. Right. But it would really be fitting, as bullish as you and I are on, on energy and some of the commodity stuff, if that stuff gets trashed right now. Yeah, of course. All, the hot, all right? the hot money gets squeezed out, yeah. okay? And then we go again. Yeah. And by the way, just one thought experiment, again, uh, 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 counterfactual. Okay, so oil's hanging around, crude's at whatever it is, 102, or it's up and down every, every day. All right, it came down from 130, but it's still up enormously off of the negative prices we saw going back to 2020. I want to remind people, you know, when crew was at 40, they said, oh, it can't go to 60 because all the shale is going to come. And it was at 60, it can't go to 80, and 80, it can't go to 100. Leave Russia and Ukraine out of it. It's a horrible thing that's going on right now. But the whole oil story, and we can talk about fundamentals later if everybody wants to, is got, it's not about technicals. It's about lack of supply. And I would just urge everyone to consider the following. Crudes north of 100, and bond yields are the 10 years at wherever it is, 280, give or take. Despite the big schmicing we've seen in the equity market of late, and by the way, newsflash, I understand Amazon's down 8% after hours as growth has slowed to its slowest growth rate ever. I don't think the, I've, I've got an Apple chart up later, but I don't think I made it out in that short so great. But Amazon is blowing up. Another one of my favorites, Robinhood blowing up, Intel blowing up, Roku blowing up. It's all good. Um, but where would, think about this for a second. You've got the 10-year at 280, John, and you've got oil north of 100. 
And that's with China going into or in this lockdown mode right now. So when they come out of it for $50 in double jeopardy, what's the price of oil going to do? What's well, the finance going to do? Well, oil was going up well before this. Totally. Well before. Totally. So you're right. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Rates, bond yields will rise until something breaks. I think where I take a different point of view is I think that point at which it breaks, and none of us know, none, none of us know, right. but I think the point at which it breaks is a lot higher than people imagine. It's by definition that oil, I mean, where we almost always get a recession is oil prices going up, throws the economy into recession. This time will be no different. I just don't think we're there yet. We'll see. But either way, either way, equities are toast. Um, we're either going to get continuing high inflation, which I think is the view you and I have, or they really will get the bit between their teeth and they will raise rates a lot. I don't think they'll raise them enough to quell inflation. They're going to have to have to break the economy, cause a real recession. So again, as Yogi would say, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. I give you recession in one direction. I give you Weimar in the other. I'm exaggerating. Here's what I'm not giving you. Goldilocks. Goldilocks is dead. Tina is dead. Their relative FOMO, he's dead. That's all gone. It ain't coming back. So put that in your dividend discount model and tell me what the valuation of the market should be. Um, I'm going to try to speed up here. So you've all seen this before. It comes from the brilliant Michael Hartnett at Merrill Lynch, just showing, and you could say it's causation, causality. I think it's causality. But the FANG stocks against the central bank balance sheet. And oh, by the way, just for $50 in double jeopardy, for those of you keeping score at home, um, an analyst I pay a lot of time to, Larry Jetalo. The napkin math he's come up with uh, on balance sheet expansion and contraction, roughly each hundred billion of Fed balance sheet expansion is worth 40 S&P points. The Fed balance sheet has gone up by $4 trillion. They've said they want to reduce it by three. You take three trillion, 30 times 40, if my math is any good, is 1,200 S&P points. He actually thinks on the way down it's going to be more than 40 because less liquidity in the market itself. So, you know, your, your target, you, you've written, your imprint, John, is talking about a, a, the 200-day and 3,500 and all no, this sort 3, of stuff. 3,600. 3,600, right. So well, that, that's the neighborhood I'm in. You know, whether we go higher or lower, wake me up at 3,600. We'll, because people say, where's it going to bottom? And John, when people say, where's the market going to bottom? What, what do you tell them? I don't know. But the, I mean, getting a direction... Is hard enough. People want to know exactly what level it's going to bottom. I don't know. Maybe at 3,600, it's going to be look unbelievably good. Or maybe at 3,600, the wheels are really going to come off. Who knows? I don't know. I just know the direction right now. I'm letting the chart talk to me. Uh, Jim Bianco spoke about this this morning as well. Biden's popularity rating versus inflation. I think that's spot on. They have to be seen to be doing something. Okay. So I was told to tone it down. <laughs> if you go on my Twitter feed, it's all there, time stamped. Um, on the left, first of all, I think the Q's lower, also lower versus the Dow and the S&P. John made the case from a technical perspective. From a valuation perspective, Revenue and earnings, growth, acceleration, deceleration, I come to the same place. This chart's a little bit busy, but it comes from my friend Albert Saporta. The dark line is the price of Apple. The purple line shows you the operating margins of Apple. So for all the talk about, you know, it's a healthcare company, it's this, it's that, it's wearables, yada, 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 okay, it's a software company. No, no. The margins have been the same for the last 10 years. They haven't gone anywhere. However, the price to sales ratio has gone up. Now, when you get to be a $3 trillion market cap and your growth slows to 2% and you're on, I don't know, 29 times earnings, whatever the number is, the wall of large numbers is going to catch up with you. And I salute Warren Buffett. He is, you know, if it was a Matt Rushmore for managers, he'd be, he'd be up there. But I think he's got, what is it, 50 or 60% of his portfolio in Apple. It's a high class problem. But John, you well know, when you have a very large oversized position, the market usually comes for you. And, um, you know, I'm not saying Apple's going to collapse 
It just had numbers. I don't. I think the reason I was looking at my phone before to see what the stock was doing. I think it's up a little bit. If anyone can tell me what it's doing, I'd appreciate it. But what I want to point out to you is it's about the numbers. And for all the talk and all the narrative and blah, 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 no. It's easy to see how it could get cut in half. If you just, if you just put the price to sales ratio um, back, you know, look, look at the peak in 2007, look at the peak, the light blue line, the, the, the peak, the peak in, in, in 2000, it's selling at 170% premium to where the peak of the price to sales ratio in 2000, and I believe a 27% premium to the peak in 2008. So when people say, oh, Apple's going to 140 or whatever, like, I'd be surprised if it didn't. So I think there's enormous downside in Apple. I offer, this is do your own work, it's not my opinion, I don't know. I got better things to short than Apple. I'm just trying to illustrate how overvalued the stock is. Okay, funds flows. It's been all about money. The Fed created too much money. People bought stocks, bonds, commodities, baseball cards, real estate. It all went up. They overcooked it. And now they got a problem. Inflation. So now the money is going away. Kind of like what they did in 99 with the uh, dot com, uh, with the uh, 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 Y2K situation. And so we had over a trillion dollars of inflows last year, unprecedented. You read all the same stuff I do, more than all the money that came in the last prior 19 years. I don't know if that's true or not. I suspect there's something wrong with the data, but I, but I digress. We've seen two weeks of selling, just two weeks. We saw 13 billion and 20 billion to take, uh, to, 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 to bastardize that line from John Paul Jones, I've, I've not yet begun to sell. If these guys decide to sell, the retail investor, hello. We all know this. Again, valuation is not good as a timing tool, but with inflation raging 8.5% and the Fed taking liquidity away and the economy slowing, possibly going into a recession, we're certainly gonna get an earnings recession you want to pay 219% of GDP? Callous concept, thank you, Matt. Okay, this is messy, and I know people are gonna say John Hussman, he's been too bearish, he's been early, he's been wrong. Basically what he's showing here is if you just take valuation, and again, valuation sucks as a timing tool, but take your starting valuation and use that as a predictor for 12-year forward returns, so similar to the work that Grantham Mayo does. It does a damn good job of predicting the market. And you can see at the peak in 99, when the blue line was at minus, was, 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 was uh, uh, at minus seven and a half percent, the market actually wound up in the next 12 years by going down at six percent, this is relative to treasury bonds, um, going down at 6% a year over the next 12 years. And then at the bottom of the market in 2008 or nine, where you can see the blue line was, was at a spike low. The, um, the projected returns were 15%. Um, uh, and now it's saying this is a bad entry point. We're both baseball fans, Josh, uh, John. This is a bad pitch to hit. Yeah, you want to hit swing at strikes. Yeah, I would just, I, I, wouldn't, I, just like, I wouldn't get in the batter's box. I'd be like, I'd throw my bat down on the ground and say, dude, get the ball over the plate. I'm not, I'm not taking a shot at this. This is insanity. I keep my signature phrase, I keep using my Twitter space, spaces is equities offer return-free risk. Whether you want to be in cash, dollar cash, and people say, well, I'm gonna lose 8% a year, blah, blah, blah. Could be worse, you could own ARC. <laughs> or you could, or actually, someone asked the question this morning, is there anything to buy? Yes, there is. It's S ARC, which is the inverse ARC. And now the funny thing is, ARC has gone down <laughs> so much, I'm sorry. <laughs> SARC has gone up so much. The price of SARC is now higher than ARC. And so someone asked me in my Twitter feed, does that mean ARC is the inverse ETF for SARC? I don't know. Okay. Now we go, as a fundamentalist, as again, I'll plead guilty to having missed a lot of the upside. I do have to, mea culpa here, I, I promised Tyler I'd do this. So the last time I spoke at this conference in 2019, and Tyler was very relieved I didn't ask him to do this again. For those of you who were there, I put, I, we, we put up a, uh, we, we redid the Aerosmith Dream On um, song, and we created like a video montage, never been publicly released. <laughs> um, 
And anyway, Tyler and Tyler got his band back together. He's he's a quite an accomplished musician, and we we rewrote the lyrics, and it was a fabulous production. And the, the stock went down. The Tesla went down like 30 percent after the conference, because they were on the ropes. It looked like they might go might go bankrupt. Thankfully, I, co I covered the short then. I've I've dabbled with it since then, but really have not been involved, just because it's been a completely narrative-driven, liquidity-driven situation. It only went up 20x after after a bottom. <laughs> I mean, I've been wrong on stocks before, but have something that goes up 20x in your face, like seriously? So this was said by, famously said by Oscar Wilde, you know, when, when people buy things, then they're focused on what the price is, but they don't understand the real inherent value of it. Like, what's the value of a good book? The book might cost a few dollars, but the words are priceless. I have taken this, and to me, this applies to the stock market today. The gamification of the stock market like Peter Lynch would say, it's not a game. I'm quoting exactly from what he would say. There's a company behind every stock, and people forget that. They certainly forget it when the Fed's handing out money to everybody, when their stimulus checks being, being given to everybody, when everything is going from up and to the right, and you're at cocktail parties, and you feel like you're, you're missing out. But it's not a game. Okay. Frank, are you there? Frank, if you're out there, can you raise your hand? Yo. So I should actually let Frank, I was inspired to do this by Frank. I should have taken the price off because you're going to guess what it is. Frank, you know where this is going. So this stock, this asset, you know, for all, not the folks in these rooms because you're too sophisticated for this, but all the geniuses at home who you know, this is easy. Just get out your rule and your crayons and look at Fibonacci in the dictionary and, away, and we're good to go. It reminds me of, you know, the, the, the 10,000 hour thing where whether it's the Beatles or Michael Jordan or whatever. You've got to put the time and the work in to be good at it. I don't care if you're a fundamental analyst or a technician. And we were in this sort of fake it till you make it stock market, fake it till you make it economy. And all the shortcomings are covered up by money and liquidity. Okay. So this stock can see from 2016, went from 100 to 600, was, and it broke out. So everyone's going to say, well, you know, it broke out, and, and, you know, whatever, and you can do unit work, and this and that, and you measure. I think I can fake it a little bit, John. You can. Okay, I can fake it well. So I'd say, you know what? The prior high was 400. It broke out from, from 600, so, you know, we had two, 300 units, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So most, most people say, yeah, that looks good. I like that. I want to own that. Know what you own. The problem was, and this goes to John's point, I mean, you had, you had a, I mean, the underperformance of Netflix was telling you something, but in a world where everyone wants to know, what's the catalyst, what's the catalyst? When the catalyst comes for you, it's too late. You can't get out. Know what you own. You have plenty of time to know to not own this. I mean, from a fundamental standpoint, you say the valuation's crazy, the growth rate is crazy, this is a commodity business, blah, blah, blah. And Netflix did give you time. It was underperforming. But if you're sti sticking to narrative, uh-uh. So stay with your discipline. I don't care if it's, you know, if you're a real proper technician, you would have gotten out because of the relative underperformance. I'm with John. He had me at relative price. He had me at momentum. I forget, forget every other indicator. As Dennis Garten would say, do more of what's working and less of what's not working. So that told you to get out, and you had a chance to get out. But, or if you look at the fundamental, you'd say, you know what, this is insanity. I've never owned this here. It's on a million times revenues. This competition coming, forget it. But if it's narrative, oh, it's Netflix. I like Reed Hastings, or did you see Orange is the New Black, or whatever their shows are. And that's the problem with the investing public. You know, they talk about the democratization of the market. You should run as fast as you can for any time anyone issues that word, utters that word. Putting the market on an app, you can just push a button, like it's a giant video game, not a good idea. It's like giving a child a loaded gun to play with. Okay. You probably didn't think this was going to happen, right? So I'm going to be careful what I say here. Um, I have nothing but great respect for Ms. Woods in terms of the business she's built. 
She is a master marketeer or marketer. Fundamental analysis, not so much. I've gone through her models. I once was an automobile analyst. I've forgotten more about Tesla than she'll ever know. But she managed to tap into the zeitgeist of the market and given the stocks that she's involved in are all really sort of long duration assets and you know, high PE or in many cases no PE because they lose money. Teladoc, hello. Um, you know, and she milked it for all she could. So kudos to her. I'm old enough to remember when Japan had a bull market. And I remember all the Japanese real estate stocks going to the moon. I mentioned that earlier. I clearly remember 1999, 2000. And I went short too early. But I made up for in spades when the Grim Reaper came. You know, people say, George, you're being too harsh. She's a woman, this, that, and everything else. No, 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 no. Garrett Von Wagener, Kevin Landis, Ryan Jacob, Alberto Villar, he wound up going to prison. Henry Blodgett, Tom Marsico, look it up. We've seen this movie before. There's nothing new under the sun. She just happens to be the flavor of the day. And I think it's really unfortunate because in a world where we have the democratization of finance and people can just invest themselves and you know, don't try this at home, she has destroyed more money than any other fund manager on the planet the last few years. And then I say that, I say, well, how can that be, George? Look at her returns. She, was, she went up some, yeah, she went up a lot. But the thing is, if you look at her returns relative to, say, the Qs and look at the beta she had on, on her portfolio, there's zero alpha in what she did, zero. She's a beta merchant. More importantly, when you look at the returns, they tend to be, they're time-weighted, they're not dollar-weighted. And I can tell you back in the days at Fidelity, people would say, well, look at Peter Lynch's records, up 29% a year. The investor didn't get 29%. Why? FOMO wasn't, invested, wasn't invented in 2009 under Ben Bernanke. We had FOMO then also. The money came in at the top and went out at the bottom. I don't remember precisely the numbers, but you know, if you told me the average Magellan investor only made 10% a year, not 29% on a dollar-weighted basis, it's probably about right. And the worst part of it is she keeps on, there's no, and John, you said it before, and a question for you, humility, knowing that you don't know. What do you, I mean, I just, I, I see she's, not, she's doing a real disservice to the public. She's like doubling down every step of the way. There's no yeah. humility at all. I, I mean, I, I just think that if she changes her modus operandi, she doesn't have a business, right? So she has to continue to promote it. So this is a, not a personal attack, but it could be anybody in that regard. 100%. She has to continue to promote 100%. it. 100%. Just a couple of related observations. And I, I could have, there are a million and one charts I could have put, put up showing this, uh, showing this. But here's just you know, all the unicorns. I mean, you know, look at the number of startups valued over a billion dollars. Jerome Powell, please call your office. Instacart valuation cut by 40%. I'm telling you right now, I, it's in my opinion, do your own work. You see a lot of the uh, more turbo, turbocharged growth-oriented investors getting destroyed. Not to pick on Tiger, Tiger Global, I wish I was as smart and successful as they were, or Melvin Capital. Go down the list, it's all the same. But Tiger Global was down 7% last year. Last number I saw, I think they're down 34% this year. And they're invested in a lot of illiquid, um, sorry, sorry, a lot of private cash flow negative companies. These companies have to come to market for more money. So you saw already money being pulled. I think, I think uh, Steve Cohn pulled his money from, or the money he had, the extra money he had put in, pulled his capital from Melvin Capital. I think Citadel did the same. There's gonna be a tremendous number of markdowns as we go out throughout the year, because these companies need more money, and there's gonna be redemption. But it ain't the religious kind. The tide is going out on this. And I, I, I can't tell you who it's going to be, but what, you know, Melvin Capital, I don't know how they're going to get away with this. There was something the other day, they want to start another fund, like do over, forget about all the capital they incinerated. But this, this fake it till you make it, just cover, you know, sell dollar bills for 80 cents, cover it up with more equity investment. That game is over. That game is over. 
this is deliberately out of date for a reason. This is not just, oh, I showed up at the scene of the crash after, you know, when there's bodies strewn in the street. Go look at my Twitter feed. I put this out last summer at 120. I think she's 46 bid today. This you've seen many a time. I'm going to say I originated this graph. But, you know, this, again, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Present it without comment, as they say. All right, so now let's go to Mr. Roke. So here's the fundamental. This is why I, like, I love when a plan comes together. He's a chart guy. I'm a fundamental guy. And in a world of higher inflation, higher interest rates, back to the 70s, I think, as Jim Bianco was referencing this morning. And no, John, uh, Jim Bianco and I did not compare notes before we put on our respective presentations. Look at what works in a higher volatility, higher inflation rate regime. Please note, technology is in discretionary at the wrong end of the playing field. And you want to be in commodity-related things, value, energy, that sort of stuff. So this is a fundamental. So again, it's not that you know, I have a narrative. And I, and, and I love it, because John will come and I'll say, oh, look at these charts. They're great charts. And I don't just buy things off of charts. And I could come to him with a story about commodity stocks and reflation benefit series, and he'd say, well, George, that's nice, but they're all going down. But when the two come together, that's when you kill it. Same thing kind of as before, it's from UBS, just showing you if you, if you normalize rates, geared to real rates where you want to be, banks, energy, real estate, et cetera. And again, you don't want to be in tech or consumer discretionary. All right, so what do we like? And unfortunately, and Tyler, next year you got to get the audio visual to work because <laughs> I was going to play the we had the, we had the theme song from this to, to kind of for the transition. And but I'm going to stop for one second. I want to get just a sip of water or Coke. This one's mine. Thanks. And again, the Jerry Lewis squeeze. Please give to World Central Kitchens if you find any of this of any interest or value. So. Where are we? This comes from my friend John. I think we're in the early innings of this commodity move. Whether oil gets rinsed the next few weeks, months, commodities, we're not talking about what you're supposed to buy tomorrow or next week. Sort of, you know, was it Ecclesiastes, John? The first nothing new under the sun. With, with nothing under the sun. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. So the offense is coming on the field. It's commodities and commodity-related stuff. You want to own pricing power in your portfolio, and you want, you want to own price makers and you want to short price takers. Tech, unfortunately, is on the backside of this. Um, and, you know, we're, we're probably not in obliviousness now because the, this is a little bit out of date because, as we know, and Helene Meisler, I know you're here, um, sentiment follows price. Give a shout out to her. By the way, was that your line or Justin's line? Her. Yours. Well played. I, I always, I always, I always call that out. And I love when all the posers and the fakers, the guys, you know, with their, who've been in the markets for five years with a $99 Discord runs out. I love when they steal your line, they claim it as their own. Any rate, game over for tech. Over, done. Um, and so we're probably past obliviousness because, because the price declines have been big enough where people are starting to get the memo. Maybe we're into disbelief, I don't know. But we're not into capitulation at all, in my humble opinion. Okay, uh, almost 100-year charts, great rotation. John and I have similar charts. Again, this comes from uh, comes from Bank of America. Um, you know, I, I I can and I do have a better chart in a second, but we really definitely think energy is a place to be. Looking at the next few years, and again, it's not a demand side problem. If you want the fundamentals, people, and I learned this. I don't try to predict oil prices. That's a fool's errand. I, I instead try to I leave that to others who are better qualified, but even those guys can't get it right. It's the hardest thing to do. But what I have learned, what's important, is that demand for oil, it's not the demand side that people, people always focus on the demand side, but that's not what's important. What's important is the supply side. Demand's actually gone down only three times in the last 50 years. It's changes in supply that are the problem. And we've gotten to a point now, I mean, energy capex has gone down 70% in the last eight years. OPEC, OPEC excess capacity is down to probably less than 3 million barrels. And this has been exacerbated by the ESG phenomenon. I'm not going to take sides here. But, you know, companies, 
they, they got put through the ringer. They, got this, they lost so much money. If you're a CFO of an energy company, the last thing in the world you want to do is put another hole in the ground. So they're not doing that anymore. Instead, they, they, they're, they're keeping the CapEx down. Oil prices are going up. Their stock prices are going up. Their share options are worth more. So there really isn't much of a supply response going on. And if the world continues to grow, I mean, maybe we'll have a recession. But again, oil demand has only gone down three times in the last 50 years. I think we could have a situation where even we get s slowing growth, we'll still have oil prices of $200 a barrel. I'll save that for the Q&A, but that's my belief. Um, just shows you how cheap energy stocks are uh, relative to um, everything else. <laughs> Everyone says, oh, it's, it's the Ukraine, it's Russia. Crude was 100 bucks before the Ukraine, come on. And this is from my friend Shrub. I have 21,000 Twitter followers. The guy's in Monaco. He's a very smart guy. Oh, a, a, pro, a free piece of information for you. I'm reliably informed that the Russians have totally disappeared from buying yachts, high-end homes, et cetera, et cetera. So the high end of the European uh, economic scene is getting, is, 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 there's no bid right now. He knows because he, he's a big money manager. He lives in uh, Monaco. One of the, again, I'm shamelessly plugging the Twitter space, but I'm also going to shamelessly plug the uh, world central kitchen because I think we have an obligation to give to those who are less fortunate than us. His is just his back of the envelope calculation. If you were to plug in the 2014 day rates, Valeris, which is a major uh, oil service company, is on 1.4 times EBITDA. So I can give you a fundamental case, an evaluation case, to go with the chart case. All right, charts. People say, George, you're a chartist. I've been asked this a few times. A technician or a fundamental guy? I try to put the two together. So we went, we went through the fundamental case for why we don't like high price stocks. And we went through the case why we like re reflation and energy. This is simply a, and, and I should have done this in a log scale, but this goes back five years. It shows you um, the orange line are the Qs, the white line, sorry, the, yeah, the orange line is the Qs, the white line is the XOP, using that as a proxy for the EMP companies. And the bottom one's the ratio. You can't quite see it, but that thing bottomed at 0.14 in 2020, it's now up to 0.38. So a little bit more, it will have been a triple off the bottom. Um, so I think it's got a long way to go looking at where this was. It's backed up by fundamentals, it's backed up by valuation, it's backed up by momentum, it's backed up by relative price. I mean, check, 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 check. If someone wants to argue the other side of this to me, I'm willing to listen, but I, I, can't, I can't see it. Okay, so this comes from this guy. Um, and John, maybe you wanna speak to this a little bit about how bear markets are different from uh, bull markets and why they're so hard. Okay, so I, I actually, I uh, did a George um, Noble Spaces thing, and I actually had the data just going into it. It was just a happenstance. I went back to the year 2000 when NASDAQ peaked in March, and I went through the October 02 low, and I just counted up how many days NASDAQ had rallied during that downturn when it was down 78%. So clearly from peak to trough, it was down almost 80%. But almost 50% of the days, it finished in the green. So it was a really difficult market to trade on a daily basis. Historically, if you look at it, you said, oh my goodness, it was easy to sell. It went down from uh, March of 2000 to October of 02, but on a daily basis, it was tough. And it rallied a lot, 15 rallies of more than 10%. The average number of days was almost 17. The average gain was 23%. Median nine days, 20% gain. The minimum was two days and you got 10, almost 11% then, and the max was 75 days and a 51% rally. So it was really hard on a daily basis. But despite how difficult it can be to trade a bear market, which is really the opposite of a bull market, right? Uh, bull markets start weak, they end strong during the day. Bear markets open up strong, usually finish weak. Um, it's hard not to get sucked in. But uh, most of the people that you speak to do want to be sucked in right, because they have to participate. There really is a great fear of missing out. It's really difficult to be a trender uh, because the business demands you be a trader. John, was it, was it your, I don't know if it was your quote, but you'll know where the quote comes from. Maybe it was Stan, the line, something to the effect. And if you don't know the answer, Frank will know the answer. Um, 
in a bull market, the hardest thing to do is to stay fully in. No, stay so in. Richard Russell Richard, said. Richard, right, could you please say that? Yeah, one? Richard Russell said, um, the hardest thing in this business is to stay in a bull market from beginning to end. The second hardest thing is to stay out of a bear market from beginning to end. And for those who might not know, Richard Russell was kind of th was the dean of newsletter writers. Uh, he passed a number of years ago, but he started writing a newsletter in the 1950s. He was a gunner, I think, in, uh, in World War II. And uh, he famously would read about five or more newspapers a day. And that was kind of how he came to his ideas about the news. But he ha was very sageful in that advice. Which goes to, again, um, I was listening to Jim Bianca this morning showing by year or quarter the various asset classes and the S&P was only down four, only down 4.6 in the first quarter. You know, what am I supposed to buy? Well, what if the answer is you're not supposed to buy? What if the answer is the water that we pull, the, the Fed has now pulled the plug out of the, uh, the drain of the bathtub and the water is going down and now we're just debating what's going to go down the fastest. Oops. Oh, so someone, you asked a question, John. Maybe you could speak. This was, I was chuckling to myself because I knew this was coming. And who was it that said they wanted nuclear war? To use the term bullish. And I said, I got a slide for you. Okay, you. Okay, 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 okay. This makes my head explode. <laughs> Not you, this. This is March 4th when the Russia thing was just getting started up. And this comes from. I don't know, some European brokerage firm I never heard of. This was making the rounds on Twitter. So they're going through the permutations and combinations. Maybe he'll have a nuke, maybe he won't. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I, and, and, and I quote, um, although there's a huge margin of error around any estimate, subjectively we would assign an uncomfortably high 10% chance of a, <laughs> I can't do this with a straight face, with a, of a 10% 10, 10 chance of a civilization ending nuclear war over the next 12 months. These odds place some credence on Brandon Carter's highly controversial doomsday argument. Even if World War III is ultimately averted, markets could experience a freak out moment over the next few weeks, similar to what happened at the outset of the pandemic. Google searches for nuclear war are already spiking. Despite the risk of nuclear war, it makes sense to stay constructive on stocks over the next 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> if, an, if an ICBM is heading your way, the size and composition of your portfolio becomes irrelevant. Thus, with purely financial perspective, you should ignore e existential risk, even if you do care about gravy from personal perspective. Bottom line, the risk of Armageddon has risen dramatically. Stay bullish on stocks on the 12 month horizon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't make this up. Um, narrative. Everyone was a, was a trade expert back in 2018 with Trump, but we go through all the iterations. Then we're all doing the COVID thing, and then the vaccines. Then everyone's a foreign policy specialist. It's like, what's the, what's the shiny object du jour? It's all narrative. And the funny thing is, and we have too many charts, but I almost put it in here. I didn't show you this one. There was one I saw I wanted to put it in, but I was driving Tyler crazy with all the changes. It showed the Bank of America, it showed the Bank of America, uh, the fund manager, monthly fund manager survey from like three months ago. And it was like 80% thought inflation's going down. I mean, do not just, if you're gonna turn on CNBC, just put, you can watch it, but just have the sound off. Well, there was right? also a survey done at the time that said most fund managers were underweight tech more than they were at the low in 08, 09. I mean, the survey was wrong. There's no way that people were underweight tech more than they were in 08, Wh 09. Which, by the way, speaking of surveys, so I have two pet, a lot of pet peeves, as you can probably tell. These surveys are bogus. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it, it could, watch what they do, not what they say. But also the way they, and then they, they, they do surveys like, for instance, you get these things from the various bulge bracket firms. And they show you hedge fund exposure, you know, in technology relative to the last five years, blah, blah, blah. But it's being done relative to the last five years. Question, John, is that the right sample set? I guess maybe, not. Maybe no. we should go back 10 years, 20 years. Well, I, I, I've thought that the playbook is not the 90s forward. The playbook is kind of late 60s to the eight, early 80s. So if you're going to normalize and z-score it, at least do it honestly. I'm almost done. Um, what a great time to be alive. So, <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds, presented with that comment. He is a great follow, by the way, on Twitter. John, we can't repeat the one. No, that no, I, I won't tell you what he said. To <laughs> <me>. <laughs> Go find it yourself. It yeah, is not politically yourself. correct. He's hilarious. 
Things, <laughs> things you don't see at the bottom. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Questions? George and John, you've just silenced the entire room. Oh. Gentlemen, well oh. done. We, we got, got one sleep. right here. They're not silenced. But Tyler, we got to squeeze people for money for the charity. That's right. I mean, come on. If you he, ask he, a question, you have to donate your favorite Fibonacci yeah, extension. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and add a zero. Okay. Um, I got a uh, first, uh, first to comment uh, on something you just said, George. Uh, there's a famous line in the, in the market that never bet on the end of the world because it will only happen once and you can't get paid. <laughs> so that seems to be the um, – the There you the, are. Okay. The, that, that seems to be the, uh, the, the sentiment of that uh, piece that you – that you read. I, I just wanted to make a comment to you that uh, you asked about Apple. Um, it reported the best quarter ever, and the stock is now down two percent. So thank you, Jim. <laughs> I mean, you mean, you mean just the thought press coming in. Uh, look, I have no idea where it's going to go. Uh, no victory laps here, but you just look. It's asymmetrical risk reward. They come out with a good number. So what? Look at the way all these things trade. God forbid. You look at the valuation. Okay, they came out with a decent number. Just imagine one time it's not going to be a decent number. Like maybe they have supply chain issues. Maybe the Chinese economy is going to implode. Maybe the forward guidance is not going to be so good. Or it'll look, like, it'll look like Amazon's number, which was 10 minutes before it, which was god awful and yeah. down 10%. So, so, Jim, as you know, everything's risk reward. It's like heads, heads you don't win, tails you lose. Like, why would you do that? And it's the biggest stock on the market. Thanks, Jim. By the way, you two, you two guys are going to become good friends. We are. Good. <laughs> Any other questions for our panelists? Well, it was John Bollinger who once told me that uh, the greatest discussion at MTA conferences happens at the bar right outside the main auditorium. And I think, uh, I think John was on to something. So uh, with that, we are going to conclude day one of the 2022 symposium. Please help me in thanking George Noble and John Rowe.